As I mentioned, we, I really was thrilled when, when Frederick agreed to come because I think you'll find his talk absolutely fascinating. Frederick is an award-winning instructor here at the Hopkins, and I'll let him give you his talk. Glad to see you all here. Uh, I'm going to introduce myself. I'm going to use some of the content from this morning to do this. It was a discussion about getting into college, getting into college, getting into graduate school. And I wanted to share my own experience with that because there's a lot of, there are a lot of misconceptions about how to do that. I was on the medical school faculty some 35 years ago, and I was on the admissions committee. And one day we had somebody come in and an application, and the head of the committee read the letter saying, this is the best student I ever had. He's wonderful, he's smart, he's tremendous. And the person looked up and said, who is this person who wrote this letter? It could be the first time she ever taught. <laughs> the person didn't get in. It was a great lesson because I learned something about how to write admission letters. I'm going to share this with you as something for advice, but also in the context of me. First of all, when someone writes a letter of recommendation, the first thing I want to ask them is, will it be a good one? <laughs> there are many times people will say, yes, I will, and they'll write, this is a dumb student. <laughs> That's not a letter you want to get out the door, okay? Okay, yes. When I write a letter of recommendation, 80% of it is about me. 20% about them. Okay, so people come to me and they say, I want to apply to a PhD program in medical school. So I will say a couple of things. One, I've taught in a business school, in a medical school, in a Johns Hopkins, and I've taught over a thousand students, and here's where the student ranks. And I won't do a, a recommendation unless they're in the top 10%. Otherwise, it's a waste of time. And then I say, in terms of science, I have a, a bachelor's degree in mathematical biology from Penn, a, a, master, a master's in biology from Rochester, and my PhD in human genetics from the University of Michigan. Nice credentials. So they look at that and say, wow, he must know something about science. <laughs> I have students who want to apply to business school. So I say, well, I've been in business off and on for 20 to 30 years. I'm also a graduate of the Sloan School of Management from MIT. I was a Sloan Fellow. I know something about business. They say, wow, I guess he does. Okay, good. Other students want to apply to law school. Okay, here's your worst nightmare. I'm a lawyer too. <laughs> <laughs> the joke is of every Jewish mother's dream, right? <laughs> you don't have any MD, Frederick. What? You don't have the MD, though. It doesn't just... <laughs> no, wait. The PhD counts. You know what I'm <laughs> The point is that when you're having these letters of recommendation put together, you want to let the person writing it clue them in that these are important things. Many times they will actually be grateful for this advice. Sometimes they won't. That's another problem. So anyway, okay, so we're going to talk about how biotech relates to now and the future. And the first part of my talk is going to be stuff that you're pretty much familiar with, just to give you a ground. <coughs> Some really interesting, fun things are happening. Okay, so I'm going to talk about what's being called personalized medicine, where DNA is a blueprint for understanding who we are. But I'm going to move to the impact of DNA and genetics on normal function as opposed to disease. Because to me, the paradigm shift that's going to happen is that understanding how genetics defines everyday life is going to be more important than understanding disease. I'm not saying don't look at disease, but we live in the here and now. We don't live 20 years in the future. And I'm going to talk about what we call nature versus nurture, and I'm going to give you some conclusions. Why the iceberg? This, by the way, is supposedly a picture of the largest iceberg in the world. Supposedly, when it melts, if it were melted, it would fill Lake Michigan. That's a lot of ice. Only 10% of an iceberg is above the water. This is where biotech is today. You heard the talk this morning. 
This is going to be the century of biology because 90% is left to discover. Now this 10% is a lot. That's still a lot. So we don't want to we don't want to sit around and say what we don't know. We want to live with what we do know because knowledge becomes incremental. Okay, so I want to take a little trip, my view of how personalized medicine existed. In the 19th century, everything was personal. We didn't know anything. So doctors did what they could, and they guessed, and they hoped, and they just, you know, did what they could. In fact, I remember somewhere the world's fastest amputation took place in the Civil War. They cut someone's leg off in 16 seconds. The surgeon also cut his hand off. <laughs> There's a moral <laughs> Okay, 20th century, with the particularly development of penicillin, the breakthrough, we moved to what's called scientific medicine, in which one size fits all. The problem is, it really doesn't work all the time. You go to a physician, they say, let's try this, and tell me what happens. There are articles appearing that most of the major drugs only work half the time, or in half the people take out the drugs. In other words, there's a lot of failure. Okay. 21st century, where we're going, where we are, it's about insight, it's about you. The key is, if we know who you are genetically, biologically, we can adjust what happens to you, not just in therapeutics or medicine, but also in your daily life. We have the opportunity to take control of things we never dreamt we could. So now I want to talk about some of the things we know about cancer. We all know about the BRCA1, BRCA2 gene predicting cancer risk in women. Um, here's what it shows. By age 70, roughly half the people who have BRCA1 or BRCA2, half the women, will develop breast cancer by age 70. An important message here is half don't. Okay? Critical message to understand about what's going on. Genetics is not deterministic. Genetics is not something that once you have a gene, your future is totally faded and known. There's a lot of movement there. My ex-wife does research in Huntington's disease, which is a dominant gene that is very bad. Identical twins, same genes, with the same gene, can have the onset appear eight years different. Well, how do you explain that? Well, the genes are the same. It's obviously the environment that changes. So this is an important message to understand. You don't lose control of things. This is a recent study that came out showing how we can predict differential risk in cancer is from smoking. Now, they're looking at 20 different genes. I put this slide here because this is another valuable message to understand where we're going. No gene works by itself. We work in combinations of things. So the days of looking at single things are going to be gone. We're a very complicated system. So what this says is that looking at the 20 genes and making a risk score, the population who have lung cancer are shifted to the right enough that you can begin to predict who would get cancer from smoking. Now obviously it's not 100% accurate, okay? And I want to kind of give you a metaphor because I get some people saying, well, what good is it if it's not 100% accurate? When you get up in the morning, when you got up this morning, how many of you turned on television to find out whether it was going to rain or not? Right, I did. We all look at the weather. Now, if you take your umbrella out of the house and it doesn't rain, do you get angry? <laughs> right? We're used to living in...